Um, it is a great uh, pleasure for me to introduce the plenary speaker for the uh, Basic Sciences track, uh, David Margolis. Uh, David is professor of uh, medicine, microbiology, and immunology, epidemiology at the University of uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's also the director of the program in translational uh, research. He is a HIV clinician and running a highly productive virology lab. He is uh, uh, extremely productive with uh, more than 100 publications in uh, uh, high impact journals, most of them. And uh, his uh, research uh, focuses on uh, um, interactions between uh, host and virus, and more recently, he really got interested in uh, eradication uh, strategies. And he's really a pioneer and uh, leader in the field, and uh, uh, this aligns uh, well with our theme, Turning the Tides, and we are delighted that he accepted our uh, invitation here today. Um, I would like to add also that David is the director of CARE. Uh, it's a consortium for AIDS uh, researchers for eradication. And uh, that consortium brings together scientists in academia and uh, um, industry to leverage um, uh, materials, uh, resources, and ideas. And uh, today, uh, he will talk about eradication of HIV infection, uh, finding the tools for the job. Please welcome David Margolis. Thank you, Matthias. It's nice to be introduced by a scientist that's smarter than you are. Um, so uh, these are my conflict of interests. Essentially, you can assume that I've pretty much worked with every drug company that makes an antiretroviral that you could possibly imagine at some point. Um, so uh, I'm happy to talk about eradication of HIV infection. Um, and my talk is um, probably pretty broad, but maybe too deep in some places. So I'll try to um, keep this uh, linked to sort of the everyday, everyday world to some extent. Um, so I don't see a whole lot of really old people in the audience that remember the last time we talked about curing AIDS at the beginning of the antiretroviral era. And that didn't work, and basically thought, and thought about the idea and work in the field was extinguished by that experience. Um, then a few years back, there was a big vaccine trial that was supposed to work, and it failed. And just at the same time, um, Tim Brown happened. And he was essentially an accident in a way, a very smart um, oncologist intentionally transplanted um, Timothy with HIV-resistant cells. And um, therapy was, I, I was never exactly sure if therapy was really intentionally stopped or sort of stopped during chemo or whatever, but basically no rebound happened. So this, but this is the only person who's been cured of HIV infection. And he went through terrible things to get there. Obviously, that's not a treatment. This is a accident of medicine. Um, but it, because of the time that it happened and because of a lot of other things happening, I think the field has turned now to really ask the question of, is this something that we should think about and work on? Um, it's not going to be easy because two other trans patients were transplanted in Boston. Um, and last summer, with great clamor at the IAS meeting, they were announced to be cured. But actually, one of them just rebounded a few weeks later, and the other rebounded a few months after that. So um, we don't exactly know all the details of why Timothy Brown was cured and these patients weren't. There are probably many factors. But I would say that that sort of an approach is not going to affect care for infected patients across the world, which is what we really need. So as you know, there are many areas of HIV research and therapy that are advancing. And um, being a Carolina Tar Heel, I'm proud to say that the lead author of this work is my boss at UNC, Mike Cohen. Um, and so this actually 
has, I think, changed the field, both about the way we think about using antivirals, antiretrovirals, um, but it leaves um, sort of a second step that we need to have to reduce the worldwide population of people that are HIV infected. And so I think currently we think about linking care into this big um, you know, unified entity where one part of care um, impacts the other. And I'm just trying to make the argument that we need a back door to get out of treatment for millions of people for decades and decades, at least for some of them. Maybe not for everyone. So why doesn't antiviral therapy itself extinguish infection? Um, there's really only one uh, for sure definite proven reason, but that doesn't mean that there's not more than one reason. The one definitely identified unquestionable latent reservoir is the resting CD4 T cell. Um, there are numerous other cells that have the potential to contain virus that's replication competent and can spread and restart infection if therapy is stopped and persist for a long time. But none of those compartments are as well proven and validated as CD4 T cells. And I will predict to you that some of those compartments now that we're talking about are going to turn out not to be a problem, but others still may. And then there's an ongoing debate about whether enough drug gets to every nook and cranny of the body all the time to prevent new replication. Now, that's different than expression of virus, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So how does latency happen? We think that latency mostly happens as an accident, part of the normal biology of T cells. They see an antigen and expand and proliferate, and that step, the proliferating cell, is the ideal milieu for HIV infection. HIV infects those cells. Most of those cells make virus and die. A very few of them, by various means that we don't completely understand, do what memory cells are supposed to do, revert to the resting state to create immunological memory, and they trap the virus in there by accident. Some of the other cells in this pathway may be latently infected at a much, rare, much lesser rate. So there's certainly probably a diversity to the latent CD4 reservoir. But when we study patients, and this is the work of Bob and Janet Silicano, and uh, we recently, uh, and, and when we study patients and measure the frequency of infection in resting T cells harvested from patients suppressed durably on therapy, we say, see that the number is very stable. And this comes to the calculation that it would take decades and decades and decades of therapy for this reservoir to decay on its own, basically impractical. <coughs> but measuring infection of resting CD4 cells, directly measuring that latent reservoir, is really, really hard and expensive and takes a lot of time in the hood, in the lab. And fortunately, I have four people that work in my lab that that's basically all they do. But that can't be done in any sort of clinical lab. It's a, it's a highly specialized research tool. So are there other ways to measure latency? Unfortunately, I think not really, at least not now. So this is a paper. It's a large collaboration. Um, from the Silicano lab and others, um, looking at HIV DNA in various forms. And um, I'm trying to, uh, I'm not getting a pointer to work. But anyways, um, the viral outgrowth assay is all the way to the left. That's the true measure of latent reservoir. Notice this is a log scale. All the other measures of HIV DNA are very much more uh, frequent than true latent infection. And unfortunately, you can't even well associate or characterize those two numbers. They're not so tightly enough associated to make a prediction. And the reason is that most of this DNA is mutated and defective and does not make virus. Um, 
There's another phenomenon that we can measure in patients that are suppressed on therapy. That's residual viremia or low-level viremia. This is by the single copy assay, for instance. And you see that below the level of 50 copies, many patients have occasionally detectable HIV RNA, um, and some patients do not. But unfortunately, most patients on therapy, that assay comes to be in the lower part of the, the threshold of the dynamic range. And um, again, this number is poorly um, correlated with the frequency, the size of the latent reservoir. In patients with very large latent reservoirs, there's some data that you're more likely to detect occasionally or uh, this sort of viremia. And in patients with small reservoirs, it's less likely. But it's not useful as a dynamic tool to use in studies or interventions to follow things over time, at least not so far. So this is the situation that we are faced with in patients that are doing well, have immune reconstitution, they take their pill a day or whatever it is, they come to clinic, and they sit down next to you and say, Doc, I'm doing fine, you know, just give me a refill, but really, when is somebody going to figure out how to get rid of this? When can I stop taking my pill? And this is a, the situation we have. There's a few, very few latently infected cells. If therapy stops, they can, we believe, reignite replication and spread infection. And then there's this other phenomena, the low copy viremia phenomena, that we don't exactly understand. All the genetic evidence suggest that these are cells that were infected before the onset, before therapy impacted the patient and stopped replication because all the genomes are related to genomes that were found before therapy. There does not appear to be any evolution of these viruses, so they do not appear to be actually infecting new cells, acquiring mutations, and spreading it all. <coughs> so again, there are some there's some data to claim that there's ongoing replication in patients, but there's a mass of genetic data now to suggest that that doesn't really happen. And that what's being shown in the picture of the drugs blocking access of all effective replication is really happening, at least at the measures that we can, at least at the level we can measure. And so um, our sort of approach is that the first thing we need to do is to develop anti-latency therapy, to find a way to make the latently infected invisible cells impervious to any drug because there's no um, protein, antigen, or not even much viral RNA being made, so there you can't. There's no drug target to hit, and in, in, invisible to the immune system because they're not making antigen to make them visible again. We don't necessarily have to kill them with this first step. That would be nice. But at least we have to make them visible. <laughs> There's some associated challenges to having clearance of infection. Are we really clearing all the infected cells? Is it really true that a therapy is really stopping all new infection of cells? Um, but then we probably need a second step to help clear the infected cells more effectively. And I think the, the evidence of that um, is, is that, that the current immune system that our patients have is ineffective to clear infection is the phenomena of low-level viremia. There are some cells somewhere that are releasing particles, releasing antigen. We can amplify them in plasma with a clinical test but the immune system is not seeing that and clearing those cells, which at least as far as we can tell. <coughs> so let's go back to the target. So the virus integrates into the host cell. The cell enters the resting state. This is a latently infected cell. So the target is a piece of DNA. So this is like cancer therapy. How do we target a piece of DNA? Well, we know a lot about, uh, and I'm not going to go into this in any detail, the various levels of molecular control that allow the virus to enter the turned off state and keep it there. 
And so as we almost always find patients after they've been infected for a while, Latency is established in every patient we see, and even in the acutely infected patients we've studied, started on therapy within, in some cases, two or three days after the day we think they were exposed to HIV, we can find latently infected cells in those patients. So I don't think that it's possible to treat anyone early enough to ablate latency unless you're treating them early enough to stop infection. Um, but there are targets, these mechanisms, that once the virus enters the latent state, there are host cellular targets that help the virus stay off. And if we remove those breaks, the hypothesis was the virus would come out to some extent. And the first target that we've been able to look at and try to validate is what's called histone acetylation. As many of you know, DNA in orange is wrapped around histone proteins in green, and this physical structure of the chromatin is one of the levels that tells a gene whether it's okay to be turned on or turned off. And the structure of the histones is modified by all these chemical post-translational modifications, acetylation being one of them. And so a simple way to think of it is to think of the deacetylated so-called tightly wound, although it's not really that tightly wound, chromatin is turned off, and the acetylated chromatin is turned on. Um, and the idea was, um, a, and in over a number of years, studies of many groups, including my own, showed that the deacetylated state was correlated with latency, that acetylating histones around the HIV genome allowed the virus to be expressed. So we wanted to see if that could actually be moved into the clinic. So we, oh, that's great, thanks. The green. So, um, so this is the resting CD4 cell outgrowth assay. The same assay that was, that's used by Bob Silicano's lab to make all those dots on the screen that showed you the frequency of the latent reservoir. We take an aviremic patient, stable on therapy, they go down to the blood bank, they um, undergo leukapheresis, where instead of donating all their blood components, they're just donating white blood cells. We get a leukopack of four billion lymphocytes. We mix that with antibodies and put it over a column. And so everything that has a not CD4 cell marker or has an activate, activation marker gets captured on the column, and the only thing that drips out at the bottom are CD4 positive resting T cells. So those are the, that's the population in which latency resides. So we bring those cells to the lab. We incubate those cells with um, inhibitors of steps prior to integration so that if there are any RNA molecules or DNA um, reverse transcripts that are on their way to integrating, they won't make it and we won't count them. Then we blast the cells with mitogen in optimal situations, to optimal um, setting to make the virus come out. And then we count how many viruses come out. And this also gives us an opportunity to test drugs to do the same thing at this step. <laughs> and measuring the virus coming out is rather laborious, um, but it's basically limiting dilution co-culture but it gives you a very large dynamic range, and for the rare frequency of the event, a relatively tight confidence interval. And so using techniques like this, we could show that, for instance, uh, well, there's a laser, I can't see it, it's okay. You can see um, that the PHA dots are about the same as the valproic acid dots. Valproic acid is an HDAC inhibitor. HDACs block the deacetylation of chromatin and allow acetylation of chromatin. And so acetylation of chromatin in cells globally allowed the expression of virus in these outgrowth assays. And a specific HDAC inhibitor, a class one HDAC inhibitor in blue, did just as good a job as a general one like Valproate, whereas the class two inhibitors didn't work. So we now know that it's the, of the family of HDAC enzymes, we're sort of narrowing the target of which HDACs we need to target, 
to disrupt HIV. So eventually this went all the way to a clinical experiment in people where we gave them a potent specific class one HDEC inhibitor called Varinostat or Saha and showed induction of expression from latency. So let me show you how that actually worked. So we did the same assay, but instead of counting, I'm, this probably works, I'm probably just not pressing the right button. Instead of counting viruses, we counted uh, RNA. Ah, there we go. <coughs> so at this step, when we have the cells, instead of growing them in culture, we do PCR. So we measure the RNA in cells right after they come out of the patient, and we could use these cells to test drugs ex vivo outside of the patient by exposing the cells to drugs and see if those drugs induce expression of RNA. And then we basically just do replicate PCR on pools of millions of cells to detect levels of RNA, and we can get a number of HIV RNA per million resting CD4 T cells. <coughs> so this was the before the patient got the drug step of the experiment where we measured the level of RNA in pools of a million resting cells in yellow in each patient the level of HIV RNA expressed in those cells when you blast them with mitogen and activate them as much as possible, that's in red, and the level when they were exposed to Saha or Varinostat, the HDEC inhibitor that appears to reverse latency, at the concentration for the period of time that the drug could be seen in a patient after they took a pill. And so that showed that in these eight patients, there was enough RNA to measure, and there was enough of a change that could be predicted that we might be able to measure it in the clinic. And I'd say importantly, and we've gone on from this to look at some more patients, some, many patients actually have such low levels of latency, a latent infection, that we can hardly measure anything at baseline, and outside of the body, we can hardly measure any induction by the drug. So some patients have bigger reservoirs. They're easier to study in this sort of way, and other patients are harder. But in any case, when we selected these eight patients where we knew we could measure that something would happen, and then we measured Saha or Varinostat in their blood to know when the level peaked and when the change might be seen, we could pick the time to leukophrese them after their dose of drug and <coughs> measure the change. Uh, all right and measure the change of RNA that I showed you in that first slide with the yellow and blue bars. And so in all eight of these patients, we were able to measure a statistically significant increase of expression of HIV RNA in their resting CD4 cells after they had taken the drug. This approach has been studied by two other groups, Sharon Lewin's group in Australia and um, the Tolstrup group in Denmark. And in both cases, um, the studies were done in different ways using different assays. The similarity being that in both cases, they did see this induction of RNA after the first dose of Varinostat here, from there to there. After that first dose, to me, things get a little murky. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. So we've been, we've done some further studies, so we went on to do uh, a multiple dose study. Since we'd shown induction from the first dose, we needed to show how do you get repeated induction to repeatedly perturb the reservoir and hopefully lead to eradication. <coughs> um, so we went to the cancer literature and we essentially made it up because nobody's done this before. Um, and so from the cancer literature, we picked the effective dose from the first dose study of 400 milligrams a day, and we figured that we could give it three times a week, and we figured the patients probably needed some rest be to avoid any toxicity, um, basically a grade one toxic, more than a grade one toxicity in this study was a stopping rule, so that's pretty tough to do. Um, and uh, we figured we would look at induction in the patients from the first study that we knew they had already induced at the first dose, 
we'd look at it at dose 11 and dose 22 because we can't leukapheresis people every day. Uh, it's just not safe, practical, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, at least in our hands, uh, and this was just, I think it's online in JID. I'm not sure it's actually published in paper yet. Um, things are not so easy. Um, so here is the induction that we saw in the five patients that were willing to come back to be retested in their first dose. But after dose 11 and 22, we saw almost no induction of HIV RNA in a fold way. When we looked at histone acetylation, this is the cellular marker that the, the drug, the HDAC inhibitor of Rinoset or Saha, is doing its effect, is acetylating histones in cells in general. We saw a modest uh, two-fold or 1.7-fold, actually, increase of acetylation after the 400 milligram dose. But later on, uh, the data was not so clean. Um, so one thought that we have is that uh, it takes actually a while for the acetylation to go back to baseline in cells. And so the viral promoters may go through this sort of refractory period to allow the, that where they need to sort of reset to be responsive to the second dose of um, the anti-latency agent. So that's a hypothesis that's under active investigation. And there's some data from that in the lab. Um, <coughs> this is a cell line model. This is not a real patient cell that has a virus in it, a single virus that makes the GFP, green fluorescent reporter. So when the virus grows on, the cell turns green. If you hit the cell once with Saha, actually only a fraction of the cells actually turn on. And this is a widely seen phenomenon in um, the study of HIV expression. If you then let the cells, you separate the cells by flow into green and into not green and green, and let them rest for four days until they become not green again, and you hit them with the second dose, you see about the same fraction of the population turn on again, but it didn't matter whether you came from a responsive or non-responsive promoter uh, uh, background, right? These cells are dividing, so they're the progeny <coughs> of the original cells. So it appears that each induction event is a relatively, at least to a, with an agent of a single mechanism, is a relatively stochastic thing. You'll only flush out a part of the reservoir each time. Uh, and so we probably certainly have a lot to learn about combination anti-latency therapy, which is probably where we're going. Um, I'm going to skip this other point. Um, but basically, I think it's pretty well shown now that an HDAC inhibitor, because actually one of the studies didn't use verinostat, used another inhibitor called panabinostat. An HDAC inhibitor can disrupt latency at least for a moment in time in vivo, but exactly how to use this strategy over and over again to display the reservoir so it could be cleared is something we have a lot more work to do. So one aspect of this question is, will HDAC inhibitors be enough? And certainly, there's a lot of research recently suggesting that HDAC inhibitors may not be optimal. <coughs> you might need different um, approaches or combination approaches. And some um, data also to suggest that simply disrupting latency, inducing RNA expression that would lead to some protein antigen expression of the virus for some period of time may not be enough to definitely make all of those cells die. Um, I'm going to actually just skip some of this through. <coughs> so we've, uh, and others, but uh, I'll highlight our work because I'm, I'm just that way, um, uh, have engaged to look for other things that disrupt latency. And so this is a part of our care collaborations um, with uh, multiple academic investigators and Merck. Um, 
in a latent T cell model uh, made in Jonathan Karn's lab, one of those models that makes GFP to tell you whether the virus model turned on or not. This allows high throughput screening. So that can go to the scientific factory at Merck, giant robots, and they can screen almost 3 million compounds in the Merck library. And so they found a lot of compounds that disrupted latency in this model. And um, some of them also disrupted latency even better when there was a little bit of Varinostat or Saha added to the, exper added to the, to the culture. And so happily to me, some of them, 16% of all these compounds were HDAC inhibitors. So that sort of, again, validated this is a reasonable approach. A lot of them were unknown, and that gives us a lot of work to do to figure out what they are and how they work. And 17% of them were something called Farnesyl transferase inhibitors, which when I first saw this data, I vaguely remembered that word, but I had no idea what it was. Um, but it's another one of these very complicated post-transcriptional modifications of proteins that the cell uses to shuttle proteins around and tell proteins which place to go and when to live and when to die in the cell. And it turned out that Merck had been studying Farnesyl transferase inhibitors for quite some time as an anti-cancer approach. So in their 3 million compound library, there were a lot of FTIs, and they knew a lot about them, so it gave us a big leg up. So these are all the FTIs that induce from latency. And you can see that their induction is mathematically associated with their potency of inducing Farnesyl transferase inhibition. Merck also knew that there were two structural classes of FTIs. And um, both structural classes that work by different mechanisms in the active pocket, and that's the active pocket there. Um, were found in the screen. So this was evidence that it was actually the event of in inhibiting foreign CL transferase that allowed induction from latency in this model system. So we took that to the patient assay and asked, does the drug actually disrupt latency in cells from patients? And this is still ongoing work. We've been only able to um, study cells from seven patients so far. And in four of them, we see data like this, which looks positive. And in the other three, we just basically don't see much signal at all, even if with, we, with maximal stimulation. So again, it's a question of sometimes patients have so little latent infection, it's hard to measure things robustly. But here you can see um, this is a minimal, uh, minimal exposure of Saha. Uh, chosen to have almost no effect, and it does. So this is the background vehicle control uh, of how frequently we, we recover virus from the cultures um, compared to maximal activation. This is uh, Merck 17, one of the FTIs, and this is Merck 17 and Saha together. So this is not, you know, super home run data, but it is uh, it is an advance. Interestingly. Um, the FTIs appear to, to synergize, at least in these model systems, not in patient cells, with anything known to disrupt latency. So you see there prostratin, that's a PKC agonist, that uh, Samoan herb, uh, TNF, which is obviously something we don't want to use for patients, but it's a mechanistic point that it appears that we might be able to just assemble different strategies to disrupt latency and test them in combination. So I've talked about doing things in cells in the lab and doing things in people in the clinic, but jumping from one to the other is really hard to do, and you can only do it usually when you have a drug that the FDA or someone else has already approved for another use, and that's not going to happen very often. So we need model systems to be able to move these new concepts or new molecules through to the clinic. <coughs> so um, this is a paper, uh, and I'm going to give you actually no really great encouragement in the next couple of slides. <laughs> um, so this is a paper that our group, the care group, uh, published recently, looking at all of the, at that time, published primary cell models of latency and how they could be used for reagent testing. 
So a primary cell model of latency is trying to be not a cell line model, um, essentially a cancer cell with a virus in it that grows forever in the lab, not a patient cell, but something in the middle. So we take a HIV uninfected um, <coughs> um, CD4 cell, infect it with virus in the lab in the presence of various cytokines, try to put that vi cell back to sleep, and some of those cells end up being, quote unquote, latently infected. So it's a model of latency. It may or may not be entirely accurate. And um, there are seven or eight different laboratories that are published different, slightly different recipes of how to do this. And so we compared all the models and how they responded to different signals. And each signal, the details aren't important, uh, are there in the, in the colors. But you can see that going down from the top, the top line are patient cells, the patient cell assay in our lab, this line here. <coughs> you can see that every model reflects some signals well, but every model ignores some other signal that patient cells respond to. So we essentially have models, but none of them are perfect. There's another model you can use. Uh, this is a whole organism that's infected by a whole retrovirus, and you can see um, viral load in black, and when the monkeys are put on triple combination therapy, you can measure latency in those animals, and that's the colored lines. Um, so that's one system that we can use. <laughs> More recently, um, we've worked with the so-called humanized mouse. Um, this, this one's calling his mom and saying, get me out of the lab. <laughs> They're going to do bad things to me, and, and we do. <laughs> so these are immunodeficient mice that are implanted with um, uh, fetal liver thymus tissue to make a synthetic thymus. And then they're implanted with CD34 stem cells from the same um, donor. <laughs> they get human cells throughout the lymphoid system of the mouse. Their lymphoid system is reconstituted with human cells. And here you can see in situ hybridization of HIV RNA being expressed in an infected mouse all over the tissue of the mouse. So we can put these mice on heart uh, in orange and suppress them, and at the bottom, when we stop heart, we get viral rebound. So now the mouse is a really expensive, complicated model of the human immune system with virus and therapy going on. So we can sacrifice the mice and take all of their tissue, put it over a column, and isolate the human cells from the mouse at the bottom of the slide there. And those can be human purified as human CD3 cells, human CD4 cells also at the bottom, and resting human CD4 cells. So now instead of obtaining resting cells from a patient, we can obtain them from the mouse, and we can put them into culture in exactly the same system we do for human cells and quantitate the, infect the, the frequency of latent infection in these mice. So this is a platform that we might be able to use to test different approaches, be they chemical or immunologic. And um, we've recently done that with our colleague Victor Garcia, taking mice that were on therapy that still had low, so-called low-level viremia in the tissue that you can measure, and adding an immunotoxin to the, to, the, to the mice. This is an immunotoxin that binds HIV envelope but has a toxin on it, so it kills cells that are expressing HIV envelope on their surface. And you can see here the levels of RNA in the tissues of the mice dropped by several logs. So it's a relatively robust, although quite difficult, uh, model to work with for development. <laughs> so I've sort of told you how we can work in the lab and try to develop anti-latency therapies and talk to you a little bit about how we'd have to model the effect of those therapies in various systems before moving into clinical testing. And this is the sort of philosophy of the structure of care or collaboratory. Um, 
we have research groups working on mechanisms. Uh, for instance, last year, uh, our group and other groups described a new target called bromodomain inhibitors. This is a cancer target, but actually does also contribute to HIV latency and maybe a new anti-latency target. Um, we conducted um, unbiased high-throughput screening going in with no idea of mechanism and just finding chemicals that disrupted latency. I showed you that data. We looked at cell models. <coughs> we looked at using human cells to validate hits from earlier screens. And we looked, we are trying to advance animal model systems to be able to test these molecules and move them into the clinic. And so our goal at the beginning of the grant was within five years to go from nothing to having one or two new molecules that could go into phase one testing in people. And 2016 is coming up, and I'm getting worried. <laughs> so um, I've talked a lot about so-called the kick, disrupting latency, forcing latently infected cells to express viral antigen. I haven't talked about the next step, clearance, and I guess the clever people now call this kick and kill. Um, and so there's a lot of ways, I mean, I'm going to speed up now because I'm running out of time, a lot of ways that one could do this. Um, there's a lot of evidence now that the human immune system has becomes exhausted to some extent in responding to HIV antigens, and there are um, receptors on cells that can act as anti-exhaustion um, pathways. So we may be able to boost the immune system by tickling those receptors. I'm going to skip all this. Um, <coughs> we may also be able to vaccinate patients on therapy therapeutically. Um, I know if some of you are from the Montreal group, uh, they've been heavily involved in the development of this therapeutic vaccine concept. Um, where you take sequences from the patient's own viral RNA pool, use them to um, make the patient's own dendritic cells um, display those antigens, and then in put those dendritic cells back into the patient as a sort of a cellular, a cellular vaccine. Um, and uh, this is, for instance, some data from uh, our participation in the study of acutely infected patients, patients that had essentially on the left side no response to HIV antigen after a few doses of this vaccine had quite robust functional responses um, to the antigen of their own virus. Um, and there are other uh, ways that we can look at uh, inducing immune response, and I'm just going to skip them all for the, for the sake of time. But it doesn't take much imagination because there have been a lot of these, effect, these attempts, both in the HIV field and the cancer field, to um, restore immunity, to induce antiviral immunity, or to give cells directly that have an antiviral effect. So uh, in the big scope, I think we're just at the beginning of learning how to discover, develop, and test reagents to disrupt latency. And we have a lot of tools already to, how, to learn how to uh, upregulate the human immune response or even a synthetic immune response like an immunotoxin to infected cells. And we have to just step by step learn how these work and how to put them together. The discovery of antiviral therapy, antiretroviral therapy, was made a lot easier because we very early on had things in the lab we could do. We drop drugs on cells, and we know it's active, and we know the uh, dose we have to achieve, and we can just put it into the clinic. Um, we have to make all of that pathway again uh, for this, for this um, effort. So I thank all the investigators in care, uh, named after Martin Delaney, uh, a famous and very impactful um, HIV um, activist. <coughs> All the people in my lab up in the top, particularly Julianne Carolina, whose uh, interesting work about immune 
uh, augmentation I skipped over. Uh, Nancy Archin, who's been my partner in crime for a, a decade now, uh, studying latency. Uh, Victor, whose lab does all the humanized mouse work, and the long list of people uh, below that make the clinical trials possible, clinical experiments possible. Mostly, I think it's always important to acknowledge our um, long-time partnership with uh, HIV-positive uh, community and patients. Um, these uh, advances into the clinic depend on their participation, and I would say in pretty much every case, they have essentially nothing to gain for themselves um, from these very early attempts. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, David. On uh, behalf of CAR, uh, thanks very much again. And uh, it's a little gift. I guess it's a pointer or something. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. Next time I'll be All right, one. thanks very much. All right, yeah. take care. So in the interest of time there, I ask you to defer your questions to the debate late in the afternoon at 5 o'clock today. It's an interesting uh, event, and I hand it over uh, to Stephanie. Good morning. I am a great fan of the CAR conference, and this is a meeting that I've been coming to since I was a master's student. And one of the reasons that I'm such a great fan of this meeting is because of its unique capacity to bridge. And I'm talking about bridging scholars across disciplines. I'm talking about bridging the world of research with activism. And thank you to Richard Elliott for the compelling reminder about this in the opening remarks. I'm talking about bridging people who work within the academy with those of you who work in the real world. I'm talking about CAR's ability to geographically bridge MTV with The Rock. And I want to thank Renee Mashing for introducing me to the, the acronym MTV this, this week. It stands for Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, where many of us do this work. And CAR has the ability to take us out of those major centers and engage with those of us who work in all of the other important parts of this country. And this meeting is unique because it has literally bridged us in this ballroom with our coffee over at the St. John's Convention Center. So, it is my great pleasure to now introduce you to Dr. Virginia Bond, who is herself a highly accomplished bridger. Ginny was born in Kenya, raised in Zambia, and schooled in the UK. Her home base, academically, is at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, but she lives and works in Zambia, where she's a director at Zambart, which is itself a bridging organization. It, it does a research shop that does research on TB and HIV and also bridges the London School with the University of Zambia. In addition to bridging hemispheres and British and Zambian worldviews, Ginny's work at Zambart has largely been in the context of, of large-scale clinical trials. And yet her training is as a social anthropologist. So she is a social scientist nested in the world of public health trials. And finally, Ginny's work has, for a long time, paid explicit attention to the bridge between HIV, uh, HIV treatment and HIV prevention. And we've had some nice introductions by Kate Hankins and by Richard Parker yesterday morning starting to point to the complexities of looking at HIV treatment and prevention, HIV treatment as prevention. And what Ginny's going to do for us now is deepen our understanding of the complexities around HIV treatment as prevention by bringing new data to us from work that's coming out of Zambia and South Africa. Dr. Bond. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm my maternal grandfather's Canadian, so it's very exciting to come back to some of my roots. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the teams that I work with in South Africa within the Desmond Tutu TB Center at the University of Stellenbosch and at Zambart, as well as the SEPO2 team that's actually led by Stephanie. Um, Nixon, and also acknowledge the presence of Patty Solomon, uh, another colleague on the team. 
Um, just my conflict of interest slide. So um, today I am going to uh, just quickly talk about the two studies that I'm drawing on to reflect on experiences of HIV treatment and prevention in Zambia and South Africa and uh, around three concepts that I'm using, um, which I call silos, science and stigma. And I use those concepts to discuss the findings and then to draw some key conclusions about treatment as prevention as a concept. So the two studies that um, I'm drawing on, one was a rapid qualitative research study which preceded a community randomized trial. The other is a qualitative longitudinal study of people living with HIV in Zambia. Um, just to say a little bit about the trial, that this, uh, the, the sort of rapid uh, research was uh, related to, um, it, this trial is an HPTN 071 trial, which we most of us call POPART. Um, it aims to assess the impact of a universal test and treat approach on HIV infection in Zambia and South Africa. So the intervention involves lay health workers going door to door in, in 21 communities, encouraging HIV testing and facilitating linkage to HIV services, as well as promoting condoms, medical male circumcision, and the treatment of STIs. An early initiation of ART is encouraged in one arm of the trial, so that's in seven site communities. So these 21 communities, 12 of them are in South Africa, um, sorry, so in Zambia, scattered across six districts, and nine are in South Africa and Western Cape. Um, located in the Cape Metropole and the Winelands. Um, these are all urban communities with population sizes that vary from 160,000 in Zambia for the larger sites to 15,000, and in South Africa from 66,000 to 18,000. So preceding the implementation of this trial, we conducted um, rapid qualitative research using a broad brush survey approach that I've been involved in developing and used in other trials. And the point of this research was to document the uh, HIV landscape in all these communities. And we were going to, and to use this, these findings both to inform the trial, to interpret the trial, and to develop, to develop future social science inquiry. Um, so field work was conducted for 12 days in each of these site communities. Um, and we used uh, a sort of mix of methods, observations, discussions, key informed interviews with a variety of groups. And today, I'm sort of drawing on a rapid analysis of all this data, but more particularly on a finer analysis that I did myself on the research we specifically did with people living with HIV, with what I call health HIV specialists, which weren't necessarily biomedically trained and involved a range of people that were in a position to be better informed about HIV in these communities and with local health committees. And this just shows you the range of observation um, that we did in, in different places, both in the clinic and in the community. Um, so there's the CEPO 2 trial, um, sorry, not trial, several choose study, um, is interviewing 35 people living with HIV and on treatment, and it's drawing on WHO's classification of functioning disability and health, as well as the episodic disability framework. And um, the analysis that I'm doing today is based on analyzing the first round of interviews with um, this group of people living with HIV. So this involves uh, 18 women and 17 men, and the average time on treatment is, is about six years. So the pictures behind the analytical frame that I'm using are all from the communities um, in Zambia and South Africa. Um, so I use the concept silos to discuss HIV treatment and prevention in Zambia and South Africa and how they're experienced. And the reason I'm using the term silos is because 
The concept rose out of realizing that treatment and prevention were not on the whole linked to each other, but experienced as quite differently and each in their own silos. And I draw on Margaret Locke's concept of local biologies just to emphasize that, that biology is both material and social and very much shaped by local context. The, the concept science is both to emphasize the kind of biomedical thrust behind treatment as prevention, but also to flag the existence of alternative paradigms. And in medical anthropology, we talk about synchronism, um, which is both the kind of indicating how plural health systems are. And when people are trying to manage sickness, they often move between different systems in their quest to get well. Finally, stigma. I think um, it's really important that we document the impact of treatment on stigma, but also begin to understand the early impact of treatment as prevention on stigma, and particularly with that strong focus on the responsibility of people living with HIV to prevent transmission. I think this is a, a sort of widening concern, as Nguyen's um, comment here reveals. So, um, as Janet Seeley um, points out, we need to understand responses to HIV within um, the other things that are happening, what she refers to as the uh, broader canvas. And if the human body is complex, so are the social realities um, of these communities. So, what we did in order to compare these communities' features, we used a conceptual framework um, which revolves around the four meta-indicators presented here. Um, and just to um, show the kind of mix of informal and planned housing, this is from Zambia. Um, and then the next one is from South Africa that, that exist and coexist in these communities. And also that to, to highlight that there's different livelihood activities in, in, in the communities. South Africa is a quasi-welfare state, so many households will be in receipt of maybe one grant, um, but still people are having to um, sort of largely rely on the informal economy um, to sort of to, to get by. In Zambia, there is no welfare state, so people survive, again, largely in the informal economy. And the, these, this photograph shows South Africa um, different enterprises like selling, building materials for houses, or hairdressing, or cell phone um, fixing, and, and other goods selling. And the photos from Zambia show traders that go on a day-to-day -day basis sort of two markets to come and sell goods back in their community, including vegetables and charcoal and clothes. And the bottom right is uh, stone crushing, which is a livelihood activity in some of the communities um, where the trial is. So it was often hard to get participants to highlight the more positive features of their community. And community action that we heard about from Richard Parker and others at this conference was very highly valued, but some communities are more fragmented than others, and often these fragmentation is along sort of political and racial divisions, particularly in South Africa. Um, but, but they were much quicker, the participants, to point out the sort of daily challenges of, of life and to link HIV specifically to patterns of alcohol use, recreational drug use, transactional sex, crime, and poverty. And drug use and crime, which includes rape, um, was particularly prevalent in South Africa, and poverty was deeper in Zambia. In both countries, youth unemployment and teenage pregnancies are pressing concerns. So participants themselves sort of explained to us how HIV needs to be tackled um, within these wider vulnerabilities. And you can see from these two quotes here, one from an NGO worker that points out that, that this is not a one-dimensional, um, there's no one-dimensional way of dealing with this. Um, and and in, in Zambia as well, they sort of describe their, their sort of how, how in reality do you implement prevention when 
realities push you in the other direction. So to look first at the silos of, of treatment and prevention, and Susan Kippax uh, cautions us to link the scale of art to treatment rather than prevention. So if, if we look at, looking at this data from Zambia and from South Africa, if we focus, focus first on treatment, we see that indeed uh, antiretroviral therapy is not experienced within a treatment frame. When we asked about people's memory, almost like the community memory of antiretroviral therapy in Zambia and South Africa, in, in Zambia it stood aside much more than in South Africa. In, in Zambia it was related to progress in a broader sense and it represented very much a leap from a, an era of unprecedented death um, um, to an era where people were living, um, were able to live and be productive. And a lot of suspicions about art that were there initially um, fell away as, as people saw health uh, really drastically improve in people living with HIV and on treatment. However, in Zambia, there are understandable fears about the sustainability of drug provision. Um, in South Africa, it was much harder to talk to people about a community memory of art. People were rather related it to individual stories and also placed it within a wider discourse of basic service provisions. And in both, both countries, a bit like what, what David talked about, participants speculated on a, on a cure for HIV. Often but people don't talk about antiretroviral therapy as art, or ARVs, um, it's often talked about more obliquely um, with reference to medicine or pills or drugs. And in Zambia, there's a very wide range of euphemisms used to talk about art, which reflect on the appearance, the shape, the visible uptake, the dependency on art, and the provision of art from the government. In both countries, art is widely acknowledged as having reduced mortality and transformed the lives of people living with HIV and of their families. However, starting art in both countries is a lifelong commitment to regularly interacting with strained health systems. And these uh, challenges are listed here on the slide. And I think we need to realize that treatment as prevention could worsen these encounters with public health care services by increasing numbers. Um, in, in CEPO 2, participants complained that long-term clients were dealt with very quickly and it was hard for them to get close attention. And in Zambia, clients who were not able to make appointments were punished when they next came in by being issued with more frequent appointments. And this account from a person living with HIV in South Africa reflects, I think, how counselling, disclosure and consent procedures are imposed on people living with HIV and add steps and time um, to, to the whole interaction. It also reflects the shortage of staff in art clinics, which was characteristic of both countries. So treatment inevitably involves side effects, and in CEPO2, participants distinguish between more short-term side effects related to the start of treatment and more long-term side effects. Um, bodily changes were um, mostly experiences undesirable because it signified that you had HIV and that you were on treatment. And I think the guilt uh, about missing a dose is evidence in a pattern of people living with HIV attributing side effects sometimes to having skipped a dose. And I think this reflects a very strong adherence discourse, particularly in Zambia, that emphasizes the responsibility of people living with HIV to take their medication. Most participants highlighted that both alcohol and drug use undermined art uptake and adherence. 
But in South Africa, there was much more tolerance of taking alcohol with medication. And in, in Zambia, this was very strongly condemned. And in some instances, health staff would actually send people living with HIV who they thought was drunk um, home without any medication. In both countries, there is a strong belief, which is very much reinforced by health staff and by families and by food insecurity itself, um, that art should be accompanied by a nutritious diet and taken with food. In South Africa, there is a disability grant that some people living with HIV can access. Um, and there are also sometimes various food schemes that help buffer hunger to a degree. But in Zambia, there is currently no food aid given to people living with HIV, despite food aid schemes in the past um, having proven to have a positive impact on treatment uptake and adherence. Um, uh, people living with HIV in both countries emphasize their awareness of, of treatment being a lifelong commitment and how this made the decision to start treatment um, even harder. Another issue related to treatment in South Africa was the risk of actually being mugged for your ARVs on the way back of, from collecting them. So we heard about this in two Wineland sites, and they weren't able to replenish the stolen ARVs. The, the system wouldn't, allow, wouldn't give them any more. And finally, and but not leastly, <laughs> it was apparent that women living with HIV faced additional challenges. Um, it was harder to disclose their HIV status to partners, and that made both accessing and taking ARVs more difficult. There was also considerable pressure on pregnant women living with HIV in Zambia to bring their partners to the clinic to test for HIV. Indeed, many of the clinics considered this mandatory and penalized pregnant women who didn't comply. And there's limited evidence that this is putting women who think they may have HIV or who know they have HIV off attending antenatal care, or that women would bring fake husbands in or purchase counterfeit health cards for themselves and their children. So we look now at prevention and how this is experienced. Kalikman put a very comprehensive overview of what he calls the TASP revolution, which advocates a broader approach to TASP, and I think that's what I've heard again and again at this conference. We used a concept uh, of sort of particular methodology called concept mapping to unravel local understanding of HIV prevention with both what we call HIV specialists and with different age and gender community groups. So we use this method. What we saw is that treatment is very rarely listed under HIV prevention. And if it was listed as taking ARVs or in some other form, it came under PMTC. So some participants felt that prevention was necessary because there wasn't a cure. But the, sort of the, the, the most readily identified prevention strategies was abstinence, behavior change, and condoms, which is referred to as ABC. And the quote from, for, is, is quite an unusual example of, of one respondent who made the link between treatment and prevention and said, why don't we just add a D to ABC? Um, so prevention was often recognized as, as, as a combination of options. And, and people saw that the earlier focus on changing and curbing sexual behavior, which was so heavily emphasized in the early 1990s in both countries, was now widely perceived as having ebbed. So this lists the prevention options that emerged through this methodology in both countries. And what we can see here is that education and testing for HIV emerge as key prevention strategies with a strong emphasis on staying HIV negative. Sometimes these messages seem to go awry, as the example of stay HIV negative, stay HIV positive. In South Africa, there's no medical male circumcision listed. Um, and you can see that in Zambia, there was a much bigger pot of prevention options, but also a more moral tone to the prevention options. And in Zambia, both counseling and more casual transmission routes were often listed, as well as more traditional 
um, prevention methods like stopping sexual cleansing, which is a, a practice of uh, having sex with a widow after the husband's died. And taking ARVs, again, just to emphasize, was always linked to PMCT. In Zambia, participants were more optimistic about HIV um, prevention than in South Africa. So in South Africa, although they recognized the biomedical effectiveness of some methods, they explained how impractical um, these were in their context and sometimes in their own culture. In both countries, condom use was regarded as the most practical prevention option at hand if used often, they said, correctly and consistently. And male condoms were available, although not plentiful. Uh, female condoms were not either well-stocked or popular. And in fact, in many of the Zambian sites, women were making bracelets out of uh, female condoms. Male condom use is, um, however, challenged by use in marriage, where it's a strong symbol of mistrust, which can result in violence against women, concerns about poor storage and quality, about side effects of lubricants, um, the, the challenges of using condom use after drinking, and the desire for live, what they call live or skin-to-skin -skin penetrative sex. Medical male circumcision was much more acceptable in Zambia than in South Africa. In Zambia, the promotion of medical male circumcision has linked it quite cleverly, in a sense, to cervical prevention of cervical cancer in women, as well as reduced risk of HIV transmission. And with the exception of older men, who saw it as being appropriate only for certain tribal ethnic groups, um, and not appropriate for them because they were older. Most people, including women, were very open to medical male circumcision and relatively well informed. There were, however, limited medical male circumcision services and some concerns about how young circumcised men, in particular, considered themselves as fully protected against HIV and subsequently were taking more sexual risks. And I think the final comment about maybe from two men's groups um, about what about are we going to have anything to cut women is a reflection of both of male hegemony and how prevention tools are often subsumed by power relations um, in that context. In South Africa, um, it was hard to even talk about medical male circumcision, um, particularly with the COSA um, groups. And traditionally, COSA practice uh, male circumcision as a rite of passage into manhood. And participants talked about going to the mountains or we're still going to the bushes. And this has become a very politicized issue in South Africa. And it's very much regarded, the imposition of medical male circumcision is regarded as symbolic, as being imposed on by the West and their tradition and culture being challenged and is not considered appropriate. Um, however, there are other racial groups that are more open to medical male circumcision. Information um, amongst participants was very scant. And I think this cartoon portrays very nicely, with a lot of humor, the tension between the different male circumcision efforts. I now want to explore um, what the linkages there were and maybe were not between treatment and prevention. Firstly, um, participants were unfamiliar with the acronyms TASP, UTP, TCP, and TEST and TREAT. Um, in, in, in Zambia, there were a very small number of, uh, of Zambian sites where participants were familiar with, with PEP, and this was related to use by health workers who'd been exposed to blood, um, the use amongst rape cases, and also, interestingly, within discordant couples. Uh, there was two sites in Zambia said that, that said they'd heard on the radio about the use of Travada um, outside Zambia, and one person living with HIV, a woman, uh, mentioned prevention with positives. But all the participants were familiar with PMTCT acronym. So this, these quotes are an example of, of what I just said, UTT, what kind of animal is that? <laughs> 
So on the whole, um, or very widely actually, participants were very widely supportive of encouraging everyone to test for HIV and most were open to early initiation of art. In Zambia, um, PMTCT was acknowledged as having reduced infant mortality and strongly advocated. In South Africa, uh, participants pointed out that PMTCT had not stopped the mother getting infected since she was already infected, and it was therefore regarded as a more secondary prevention strategy. Also, some felt that even if the child was protect protected from HIV at birth, they would grow up to face the same risks as the mother and subsequently become infected with HIV. Interestingly, the CEPO2 participants only discussed prevention in relation to PMTC. And recounting um, in the next slide, it shows you how they recount the value um, of PMTCT, but also record the loss of children um, prior to accessing PMTCT. In two Zambian sites, uh, there were the health workers that had contact with particular research studies, and through that were aware of the impact of art on HIV transmission. And then there was one older women's group in a South African site that was also aware of reduced viral load once people living with HIV were taking pills. However, there was some concern that this could lead to people living with HIV stopping treatment. And the one group of health workers in Zambia advocated that it was wise to first observe and do research in this area before making it a more national strategy. So when we sort of pushed respondents to reflect more on the link between treatment and prevention, often this led to a discussion about preventing illness, about reducing viral load, and about boosting the immune system. And very occasionally, this was linked to reducing transmission to others, as reflected in these two quotes, one from South Africa and one from Zambia. And when we asked them more specifically about prevent, preventing HIV transmission through sex, um, there was a concept of reinfection between people who both have HIV, um, as well as, um, and, and why then it was necessary to use condoms in these uh, interactions. And they also raised the issue of discordant couples and of PEP, the possibility of PEP. Um, and then one point that came out quite often was that when you link treatment to prevention, it seems to be at odds with behavior change messages which have been drummed into these populations for so long. And, and it was almost like people found it hard to break away from the need for sexual behavior change. And then they quickly sort of slipped into a more moralizing discourse around behavior change that was needed to accompany treatment. Um, in both countries, and particularly in Zambia, there was a very strong focus on casual transmission of HIV. And this seems to be an attempt to disassociate the link between being infected with HIV and improper sex as was reflected in, in the quote here. I mean, I think the focus on casual transmission is also a reflection of the environment um, of poor sanitation and lack of control over a pretty crummy environment in some situations. So to move on to the concept of, of science, um, so despite the caution about treatment as prevention at population level, given both the sort of strained or weak health systems and also the over-optimistic modeling that led to the concept, it's often presented more as a truth claim. There's also a risk of slippage of tipping the scales from treatment to prevention or indeed prevention to treatment. Um, and just, I wanted to flag that in Zambia and South Africa, there are other claims from alternative paradigms. So that art is not, not only, or not always the first treatment option for people living with HIV. We also saw some evidence that there's an emerging black market around ARVs as they get used for, in alternative ways. <laughs> 
So these alternative paradigms sometimes draw on biomedical terms, techniques, and substances. An example of that would be um, traditional, male circum medical male, uh, traditional male circumcision in Zambia using a local biomedical anesthetic. Um, but also these alternative paradigms are attractive because the biomedical path doesn't offer a cure, because it's tricky, as, as I've demonstrated, and also because it can be uncertain. And these alternatives tend to focus more strongly on healing and cure than on prevention. And they're very suppressed in Zambia and South Africa by the biomedical rhetoric and often both hard to see and hard to talk about. So claims of a cure came from different corners. Firstly, faith itself is regarded as essentially protective in both countries. In other words, by adhering to what the Bible tells you, then your HIV risk is immediately very low. Secondly, faith healing is a very common social practice in all the Zambian sites, less so in South Africa. And in these faith healing sessions, both directly and indirectly, um, the possibility of cure is, is discussed and promoted. And some pastors actually actively advocate throwing away ARVs after healing sessions. Traditional healers were usually more cautious in claiming that they could cure HIV. Um, there were some instances of this, but not many. Um, one Rastafarian healer in South Africa claimed that the ARVs contained our herbs. Um, and a more worrying claim of cure, which we heard from in two sites, was the, the myth that HIV can be cured through sex with a virgin or with a girl child. Immune boosters are available in all communities, um, not as much as they were back in 2004 when we also did research, but, but they're still there. And these are a mix of herbal and other substances. In Zambia, there's, there's an immune booster called Sondashi formula, which is particularly popular and sometimes regarded as a cure. And it's also said to have been subjected to clinical trials. In practice, immune boosters and herbs are used alongside ARVs and also um, as an alternative to ARVs. Um, and traditional healers, particularly in Zambia, particularly those who belong to associations or have been directly engaged in HIV training, um, say that they do refer people living with HIV to biomedical health facilities while still managing some of the side effects with their own methods. So many people living with HIV in Zambia seem to contemplate faith healing. Um, and, and, but they also, many of them recall people living with HIV that knew, they knew, or indeed themselves, being pronounced cured, stopping ARVs, and then subsequently either dying or falling extremely ill. And one key informant talked about how pastors who instruct... Um, sorry. Sorry, I've lost a <laughs> slide here. That, this is the cartoon I was looking for. So the instructors, um, pastors who instruct people living with HIV to throw away drugs are sometimes taking the drugs themselves. So we heard about this in our research, and then this cartoon came out just last week in the paper, which illustrates the point. Um, so alternative uses of ARVs were evident in both countries. Um, recreational use was particularly evident in larger communities in Zambia. So ARVs are smoked or, or sniffed um, and sometimes combined with other recreational drugs. Um, and in all South African communities, we heard about this. Um, in Zambia, we also heard about um, ARVs being fed to chickens to make them big. Um, and also in one site as a skin bleaching product. So these alternative uses of art are both practiced and contested. And I, this is reflected in the quotes here about faith healing, um, which, which would sort of demonstrate what, what I've just presented. So finally, if we look at stigma, um, it appears that the concept of art as prevention 
acts as a catalyst to highlighting the association between having HIV and irresponsible or improper behavior. And it also prompted participants to raise the possibility that people living with HIV, both on art and not on art, are vindictively spreading HIV to others. So on the one hand, HIV stigma was said to have reduced by many participants because of art. And if we look at the CEPO2 um, participant data, it shows that being on art was a powerful tool for both coping with and challenging stigma. So participants described um, their ability to sort of turn on stigma once their health had been regained. And they would do that by either, by either directly challenging stigma or, or experience having those that stigmatize turn to them for help. However, um, the fact that, that people living with HIV are now around for longer because of treatment, the visibility of HIV services, and um, indeed treatment as prevention itself, seems to have enhanced HIV stigma in both new and old forms. So CEPO2 participants didn't talk about not anticipating or not experiencing stigma. Rather, they explained how they challenged stigma, and they remained very cautious about who they disclose their status to. So two examples of forms of stigma related to art. One is in the queue. Um, so on the one hand, queues are seen as evidence, queues at art clinics in South Africa and Zambia, uh, of reduced stigma, as, as reflected in the first quote. But on the other hand, standing and waiting in queues or hanging around the art clinic is, is, is often instigates um, sort of fears and experiences of stigma for people living with HIV, as illustrated in the second two quotes. And in addition, treatment as prevention appears to have increased the moral tone and authority around both treatment and prevention, with the onus being on people living with HIV to do the right thing and to contain the transmission of the virus, and often giving the others the right to tell people living with HIV how to live. And so there is a real risk that treatment as prevention itself could and is creating stigma and redrawing that boundary between us and them that we've worked so hard to pull down. So in conclusion, the evidence from this research in Zambia and South Africa suggests that in the process of pushing treatment as prevention as a strategy, that could turn the tide at population level is that the realities or, or silos um, is, it are not one dimensional, as one participant put it. It's not just about taking a pill for life. It's rather about taking a pill or pills alongside many other realities and challenges. It also appears that in reality, treatment and prevention are not experienced as being closely linked, with the exception of PMTCT. And in our attempt to link them within this concept, treatment as prevention, we run some risks of slippage in our focus on both. So I've highlighted under science the risk of biomedical ideology and of overlooking alternative practices and under stigma, the risk of driving stigma by putting the onus on the responsibility of people living with HIV to stop the transmission of HIV through proper behavior. So I would suggest that if, if TASP doesn't fit context and doesn't fit experience, then let's rethink. So it's time to consider stopping to promote concepts through new acronyms. We should work rather on providing people with detailed information. I mean, I'm fascinated by the amount of information here about side effects of treatment for people living with HIV. I've never, ever seen that information in Zambia um, available to people living with HIV. So those, that's the kind of detailed information that people need. I think we could also think about working within existing acronyms, as one research participant suggested, ABC. D, 
We should de-link treatment and prevention concepts and put focus on each one, since other than PMTCT, treatment and prevention are experienced and dealt with separately, and responses to both can be both particular and local. And finally, we should be careful of the risks of slippage away from treatment to prevention, since we might lose sight of the struggle with suffering in a broader sense, of the existence of alternatives, and critically heap the focus and blame on people living with HIV, as well as on other vulnerable groups, falling back into the us and them scenario. The responsibility for prevention is broader than people living with HIV. So just to finally um, acknowledge again the teams um, that I work with in Zambia and South Africa for the pop art study, the, the PIs, the participants, the ministries of health and government departments, and to acknowledge the funding from various sources for pop art, and to acknowledge the SEPO2 study that's funded by CIHR and two um, colleagues who are present here, as well as others in Zambia and elsewhere. Um, and to give special acknowledgement to this group of individuals, as well as to Adrian Kuta, who gave me some literature, for helping me shape this presentation today. Thank you. In, in one minute, I invite you to bridge yourself over to the coffee break that's going to happen at the exhibition hall at the convention center. But first, I would like to invite you to join me in thanking Ginny for what was a provocative and incredibly thoughtful journey, evidence-based journey, to help us think differently about our own work here. Thank you.